Though time it seems like I'm coming undone This walk can often feel lonely No matter what until this race is won I will stand my ground where hope can be found I will stand my ground where hope can be found Oh Lord, oh Lord, I know you hear my cry Your love is lifting me above all the lies No matter what I face, this I know in time You'll take all that is wrong and make it right You'll take all that is wrong and make it right Your strength is found at the end of my road Your grace it reaches to the hurting Still through the tears and the questioning why I will stand my ground where hope can be found I will stand my ground where hope can be found Oh Lord, oh Lord, I know you hear my cry Your love is lifting me above all the lies No matter what I face, this I know in time You'll take all that is wrong and make it right You'll take all that is wrong and make it right I will stand my ground where hope can be found. I will stand my ground where hope can be found. I will stand my ground where hope can be found. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I know you hear my cry. Your love is lifting me above all the lies. No matter what I face, this I know in time You'll take all that is wrong and make it right You'll take all that is wrong and make it right You guys have been practicing. Doing a really good job. Well, open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 4. Galatians is uh, the Magna Carta of Christianity. And as you begin to read the book, it's almost immediate. There's a real serious problem. And Paul bypasses his normal... Uh, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God. He just, he doesn't go through all that. He just gets directly to the jugular vein. And the problem was that the character and the nature of the gospel was under attack by a group of people called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics, the word Gnostics is uh, from the word Gnosis, which means to know. So these were the intellectual elite these were the college professors, and they were telling everybody else what to believe because they were so brilliant. And um, anytime you get around a group like that, quite often, I might would correct that, I guess, the thing they begin to do is to attack the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. If you ever have anybody come to your door that is trying to peddle some kind of a religious philosophy, don't let them run you all over the Bible because they'll do that. They're trained to do that. What do you believe about Jesus? 
And what they say in answer to that question tells you all you need to know. Don't let them go anywhere. You go to First John, and you can you know just read the scripture says that if you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that is the spirit of Antichrist. End of sentence. And so Paul is pretty ticked off about this. What's going on in uh, Galatia? The uh, the theme of this book is grace. Quite often, uh, these these twin themes. Titus is about the same thing, but uh, grace is personal. It is doctrinal. It is practical. This is uh, this is truth that needs to be put into play, put into practice in our lives. And Gaul is an ancient name for France, the Gaulations. And they came from that part of the world, well, where the Franks were a, a warrior tribe. And they were intent on establishing this really huge, large, massive empire <clears throat> in Europe. And during the 5th century, they invaded the area that we know today as France and Belgium and parts of Germany. And their king, his name was Clovis. Clovis was intent on beating everybody, and he did. Everybody that came against Clovis and the Franks got their heads handed to them. And they established, finally, a settled empire in the year 494 A.D. And he effectively became the king of the first unified country that became known as the land of the Franks. And the Latin word for Frank was Francia, France. And so the Gauls were the forerunners of the French people today. Uh, they were Celts. So Solomon said on one occasion that there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof, ways of death. You might think that you're right about some things, but that could be the very death of you. And there's a wrong way to do anything. Um, there's wrong belief. There's wrong thinking, the wrong choices, wrong relationships, wrong behaviors. There's wrong values. There's wrong worship, uh, wrong habits. They're just anything can be done wrong. And we do not get to determine the definition of morality. Morality doesn't evolve. It doesn't change. What was wrong 3,000 years ago, still wrong today. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what man thinks. And so the, the wrong way is fatal in this matter of salvation. If you, you can be wrong about a lot of things. You can't be wrong about this. You can be wrong about what car to buy. You might can get slickered by a used car salesman, and you buy the wrong vehicle. Um, you, can, you can make the wrong decision in business, and wrong decisions in business can lead to bankruptcy. But long, wrong decisions in the medical field can lead to death. Wrong decisions in, uh, in any area can lead to loss or diminishment, but wrong decisions about salvation are not just fatal, they're more than fatal. The Bible is very clear about this matter. Man lives... Average, 70 years. Man dies. We're separated from the physical body. The physical body dies. Christians die. The physical body of Christians dies. What happens to the soul? Does it just cease to exist? No, it does not. Every human being is eternal. Spirit is eternal. So when a person dies and they're separated from their physical body, they are either escorted into the presence of the Lord to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, the Bible says, or they are assigned an eternity in the lake of fire. Now, eternity is a long time to be wrong. Um, the first century church was comprised mostly of Hebrews or Jews, and these people found it very, very, very difficult to cut the cord to the law of Moses. The law of Moses was given to Moses, the great lawgiver. 
And they had, a, they had a history. People get attached to their family history. And they think that that's the only history there is. You know, everything else is less than this. This is our history, and the Jews were that way. You know, Abraham was their daddy. Uh, Moses was their lawgiver. The law of Moses, this, this was God's law. We are the chosen people. Y'all ain't. Y'all a bunch of filthy Gentiles. Y'all ain't chosen to do nothing. But the Jews were very, very proud of their history, and specifically this, this matter of the law of Moses. And um, they believed that if we obeyed this code, we go to heaven. That's what it is. You should obey the rules. You might not want to, but if you obey the rules, you go to heaven. And so Paul, beginning of verse number 21, look at Galatians 4. He is, he's really angry about the fact that some of these people are starting to back off of their salvation by faith now, starting to you know, go back to, to believing the law. And so he says, tell me, ye that desire, and the word desire means you're bent on, so those of you who are bent on living under the law, do ye not hear the law? In other words, your desire is not in harmony with Scripture. Don't you hear what the law says? Are you deaf? The law is telling you, I can't save you. Did you hear that? I'm not for the purpose of saving you. Are you not listening to what the law is saying? Now he says in verse number 22, For it is written, that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, and that bondmaid was Hagar. This was an Egyptian housemaid, all right? And the other by a free woman, and that was Abraham's wife, Sarah. So we've got two women in the mix here. These two characters, there was Hagar and Sarah. One is going to represent the flesh and what the flesh can produce and do, and that was Hagar. The other was going to represent God's promise, all right? Verse number 30, 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, or natural generation. But he of the free woman was by promise. And the reason that that, that that is distinguished is, Hagar and Abraham, when this boy was born from that union, they were still young enough and virile enough to produce a child sexually. That was, that was not the problem. Now, 14 years later, Abraham is 99 years old, and his wife is 90 years old, they have passed the time when they can produce children sexually. There's no way that they can have kids. Or is there? All right. Look at verse number 24. These things are an allegory. They are a story, an actual evented story with a hidden meaning. In other words, this is not just about two boys. This is about something much deeper than that. So for these are the two covenants, the one for Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar, now this is the, mount, the mountain, not the woman, Hagar, is Mount Sinai. Now what was given at Mount Sinai? The law. Okay, so what did Hagar represent? The law. What did her son represent? The law. Okay. Uh, and it answereth uh, to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So this whole system that was represented by Hagar and Ishmael and Mount Sinai, and now Jerusalem is thrown in as sort of the headquarters of this law code for salvation deal. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren, that bearest not, break forth and cry that thou travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she that hath a husband. In other words, uh, Sarah couldn't have kids and she was barren for a long time. And it seemed like that Hagar was going to come in and be the wife. She had Abraham's affection and died to die. But eventually, uh, this woman of promise, Sarah, was going to have more children. And we're talking about Christians that have been born again out of her progeny. Verse 28, now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. All right, Hagar produced Ishmael. He was the father of the Arabs. Sarah produces Isaac, who's the father of the, the progeny of the Jews. They have always fought. 
You say, well, why are the Jews and the Arabs always fighting? Because they're kin to each other. This is a family matter. All right? They're always at each other's throat and have always been that way. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, uh, the first son. Let's just talk about this analogy. Here was this woman that was just a housemate. She, was, she washed dishes, she cooked, she cleaned. And uh, they had gotten her out of Egypt somehow. We don't know the details of how Hagar came to be the housemate of Abraham. But uh, she was in his employ. Sarah, 25 years ago, God promised them a son. No boy, no boy, nothing, 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 nothing. Finally, Sarah comes to Abraham one day and says, Honey, this ain't working. And we're running out of time. We need a boy. We've got to fulfill the promise. The Lord promised us a son. And so why don't you just go into Hagar and, you know, there's, there's no promise involved here. This is not the son God promised, by the way. Okay? All that was involved here was uh, candlelight and soft music. That was it. There was no promise. So they get together one night. And nine months later, we've got this little boy that is born. He was born out of just simple, natural generation. Now, 14 years later, Ishmael is 14 years old when his baby half-brother Isaac is born. Now, this is the one God promised. But I think it's odd, not odd, it's just the way men do. Abraham is a great man of faith. You know what he named? He named his first boy Ishmael. You know what that means? God hears. And it's like he's saying, all right, God heard our prayer. Here he is. Here's the boy God promised. No, that is not the boy God promised. You did this on your own. You tried to produce promise physically, and it won't work. Now, here is this kid, this, this baby. Now, keep in mind, 99 years old at this point in history was 99 years old, like 99-year-old today. So I, I doubt if anybody in here recently has been to a baby shower for a 90-year-old woman and a 99-year-old daddy. That just, you know what I'm saying. And so here's this kid, and he is born strictly out of God's promissory authority. There's no way Sarah can get pregnant. None. There's no way we can save ourselves. None. You see, well, what if Ishmael was a really well-behaved kid? What if Ishmael went to church? What if Ishmael obeyed his mom and dad? That kid represented the flesh. I'm just telling you this, the allegory is you cannot produce life on your own. You can't. Well, I'll be a good boy. I'll go to church. I'll behave. I'll do all these things. I'll be just this wonderful, sweet girl. But if I'm not saved, if I don't have the promise birthed into me that God has made, I can't be saved. And so this was under attack in these, uh, it was a circular letter. It was sent to several churches in Gaul. And so what we've got is Paul is attacking the Gnostics for telling these people, you've got to be saved by obeying the law. And so he starts off, don't you hear what the law said? Those of you, you are, you are just bent on living under the law. Let me tell you a little story. And so he uses the story of these two boys to reveal that the law produces death. The law was never designed to save anybody. That wasn't the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to show them how sinful they were. That's it. It was like this giant magnifying glass that was slid over their lives, and they were like, oh, I didn't see that. No, well, no, you didn't see it. You don't want to see it. And I, probably everybody in here, well, maybe I can't say that. A lot of you in here, I bet you have been to like Bed Bath & Beyond. You ever seen these great big old giant magnifying mirrors with a light? And while your wife is looking for other stuff, have you ever gone and looked and turned that light on and, and that magnifying, I mean, it's magnifying 500 times and you look at, you thought you were looking pretty good, you know? 
got your hair all done, and you know, you're looking pretty sharp, and then you turn that light on, and you're like, gee, who is that? That's what the law did. It was like an x-ray machine that showed you where the brake was, but it couldn't do anything about the brake. Law couldn't save. That was never the purpose of it. As a matter of fact, here's what the law said. If you don't keep me perfectly, I'll kill you. But what did they do? The Jews worked themselves into a frazzle trying to keep the law. Oh my word, the stupid. And not only did they, they had the law, they had the Torah, they added to it. In a book called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was additions to these laws that God gave. All right? Now, some of the things, and, and they got really ridiculous. Um, there was, um, and this was, I just think it's funny. You couldn't walk more than 2,000 cubits on the Sabbath. And the reason it was because the, the furthest tent in the camp was 2,000 cubits from the tabernacle. You could walk to the tabernacle, and that was it. And then you come back home. But you can go any further than that. And so the Jews were like, eh, you know, I'll tell you what let's do. We can pack a lunch. And we can walk 2,000 cubits and stop and eat lunch. And that becomes our home. And then we can walk another 2,000 cubits. So if you took enough food, you could go anywhere. And so this was, this was the way they got around, uh, you know, these, these rules. They just added to them. They just, and so if you didn't obey all these ridiculous little restrictions and ceremonial rules and regulations, there's no way that you could be saved. Well, Paul is asking this question. Can't you hear what the law is telling you? The law itself is saying, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You can't keep me. It was, well, then what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to escort them to somebody that could keep the law. All right? Jesus is the only individual that's ever been born without a sin nature. No sin account. This man's life was... Where did, where did the law come from? Where did the perfections of the law of Moses come from? Did God just make that stuff up? Or... Was Jesus Christ the very embodiment of the perfections of the law of Moses? Christ was the very embodiment of these things. And so he kept the law perfectly because that's just his nature to do that. And so those who are in Christ, guess what? Perfection is accredited to you because you are in Christ. Salvation now, because of him, is added to your account. It is accredited to your account. There's nothing we can do, and that's the whole purpose of the analogy. The Jews say, well, look, we're going to Ishmaelite our salvation. No, you're not. We're going to just obey the rules and get saved. No, you're not. Because the, the salvation is not by the flesh. It's not by the law. It is by a promise. Now, who was the promised child? Ishmael or Isaac? Which one did God promise? There are two boys. Isaac. So what was wrong with Ishmael? He wasn't the one God promised. Now, as a matter of fact, the Lord told this boy's mother and Abraham, he's going to be a wild man. Every man's hand's going to be against him. His hand's going to be against everybody. Has that been historically accurate? This, these people have just been wild. So that's the flesh. Well, I'll, I'll train the flesh. No, you can't train the flesh. Well, I'll, uh, I'll rededicate the, the flesh. You can't rededicate the flesh. It is a wild animal with reference to salvation cannot do anything but kill you. Now, I don't care if these are church supervised activities i don't care if it is church directed ceremonies i don't it doesn't matter baptism will not save you coming to church will not save you uh being a good boy or girl will not save you those are just simply attempts to raise ishmael from the dead and say hey man hey come on save me come on come on man ishmael can't do that that's not the the kid that god promised but here we are, just like Abraham, you know, God hears. God hears. Hey, 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 see me? Hey, are you listening to what I'm doing down here? Well, that doesn't matter what we're doing down here. 
it brings death. You, you can't be good enough to go to heaven. That's not even the point of salvation, as a matter of fact. And so the allegory really is kind of simple to understand. Uh, Paul goes on to say now in verse number 27, it is, it is written, rejoice, the one that bears not. And so here she was at 90 years old. She gets pregnant. And one night, on a sheepskin rug in a goatskin tent, this human promise is born. This little boy is born, a 99-year-old dad standing outside, and he hears his son's cry echoing off the mountains. God's word is fulfilled. Promise. I'll give you a son. He didn't say, I'll give you a son while you're strong enough to do it yourself. That, that was the whole point. He didn't say, I'm going I'm to give you a son while you're still virile enough to produce a child. Abraham and Sarah did not know the time of life when the baby was going to be born. All they, all they had was this promise. I'm going to give you a boy. I'm going to give you a son. Well, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Year one, two, three, nothing, four, five, nothing, six, seven, nothing, 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 nothing. And finally, Sarah gives up. And apparently so did Abraham. Well, it looks like God forgot us. It's not going to happen. He is. Go force God's promise. Go. Now, could you imagine a woman surrendering her husband to do that? But that's what happened. And then nine months later, the wrong boy is born. I'm telling you simply this. Autosoderism, self-salvation, is the wrong child. We cannot produce life through flesh, through body. You can't produce life through effort, through human ingenuity, through human theology. You can't. A church cannot pronounce you saved. A church cannot produce salvation. We can't do that. That is outside the bound, outside the venue of our authority. We cannot do that. This can only happen when a person accepts the promise of the Son that Jesus would come. And He became us on the cross. He became you. He became me. My sin account, your sin account was hung on Him. He was, he was blamed for what we were. He was blamed for what we have done. He took all the guilt. He said, well, that's not fair. No, that's grace. God's grace simply allowed that to happen. And so here we have this, um, a, a false misrepresentation can't produce life. And again, here's, you know, here's Abraham well, what are we going to call him? We're going to call him God Hears. Well, God heard all right. And the thing is, he, he blessed that kid. Ishmael had 12 sons. Isaac had 12 sons. These sons of Ishmael became the tribes from which the Arabs came. We've got the 12 tribes of Israel over here. This bunch and this bunch have been at loggerheads for 3,500 years. That's the way it's going to be until Jesus comes back. Now here's, and, and here's the, the analogy with that. The flesh is always going to fight the spirit. Do you find the Christian life a cakewalk? Do you find it easy to do the right thing? Or do you find Ishmael and Isaac battling in your mind every day? Just, just constant, oh man. I know this is what I need to do, but boy, I sure would like to do that. Ishmael and Isaac still fighting. But with regards to our salvation, uh, if a person can get saved by his works, now let's say, if a person can get saved by being baptized or joining a church or taking the Lord's Supper or whatever. 
What was the purpose of the death of Christ? Could he not have saved himself a trip to Bethlehem? If there was another way, if we could stamp on all of our efforts, God hears, God hears, God sees, hey, I got my baptism certificate, I got my church member, you know, if, if that's how a person can be saved, why all of this wasted suffering? But I submit to you that nothing we do produces our salvation. I think it is satanic to preach or to believe that anything but faith in Jesus Christ can save you. That's why Paul was so angry in the book of Galatians. Because he did a lot of work. He planted the seed. He won these people to the Lord. They got saved and then in comes this bunch. And they began to Teach, oh, no, 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 you've got to go back and obey the law of Moses. and You've got to go back under Ishmael. We're going to Ishmael. We're, we're inviting Ishmael into the house. We're inviting the flesh back into the house. And I see that happening in churches all across the world, basically. They're inviting Ishmael back. They're inviting the flesh back. What we, what we do, how, you know, how nice we are, you know, we're feeding the poor, we're, you know, it got all of the, and nothing wrong with those things, I'm just telling you, they don't produce salvation. It is an attempt to try to get life out of a corpse. And it, it doesn't work. And God has been very clear about that from the beginning, and then he even <coughs> gives us this little analogy. And so, you know, the, the Jews attempted, they really want Ishmael to be the son of promise. Now why? Why is Ishmael their hero? They don't know it, but it's their hero. Because it makes us the hero of our salvation story. It's based on what I do. It's based on how cool I am. It's based on how, on, on how obedient I am and how godly and righteous and you throw in all the adjectives you want. They still believe that today. So they, they involved this dead, non-promised son to be the foundation of their redemption. And Paul says, ah, you people need to listen to the law you say you believe. The law says you can't keep me. The law says I am temporary. I'm temporary. I will escort you to Christ and then I will hand you off to Christ just like when we have a wedding. Keith, you performed a wedding I think, recently. Did she come down an aisle? Who brought her down the aisle? Her daddy. And here's the picture. Um, this young lady comes down the aisle escorted by her dad. That's symbolic. Who has walked her through her life to this point in time? Who has paid her bills and taken her to the doctor and changed her diapers and fed her and bought her a car? And did, Her daddy and her mom did, more than likely. So he's escorting her down. And usually, if we have it here, they'll stop about right there. He's done as much as he can do. He's been the man in her life all these years, 18, 19, 20, however old she is. And then they'll get to right here and I'll have a couple of, things to say and I'm say you'll get your bride and at this point this young man will step up and you can hear dad Arr. you know and his lips yeah uh-huh <laughs> or or here there you have her now <laughs> either one and so he goes and gets her dad has just passed her off to the next man in her life okay now when a person gets saved they are, they've been escorted through life and you come and you meet Christ at some point. And for the Jew, it was the law that escorted them down the aisle. This was a temporary thing. It was the greatest code of human behavior that the world has ever seen. And the greatest code of human behavior still couldn't save anybody. You could not find a greater moral code than the law of Moses. But then it's still saying, I can't help you. I can bring you to the one that does save, which is exactly what the law did. But the, but the Jews, it would be like this young woman going, 
no, no, Dad, no, 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 take me back. And she walks back down the aisle and leaves this guy at the altar. Say, well, that would be that would be really dumb. You're right. That's exactly what man has done. And we might not follow the law of Moses, but look at the rules and the regulations. Look at what churches have done. They they printed their own moral sheet that you have to obey before you can be saved. All of that stuff, all of that stuff is death ridden. Death ridden. It's it's all. Ishmael based our salvation is based on the promise that the son would come and that son was a was symbolized by Isaac Jesus was the promised son that would come and take our sin you believe that if you don't believe that then you're still on Ishmael's side you're still trying to produce your salvation through an Ishmaelitis type of behavior and I'm just telling you it won't work it won't work. You will die without Christ. Every bow your heads. Every head bowed. I hope that you've understood what I've tried to tell you this morning. Salvation is not produced by human effort. It is produced by promise. God promised to save those that would come to him by faith in Jesus Christ. You're in one camp or the other. Prayer is if you are in this camp of flesh-produced salvation, leave, exit immediately, come to Christ. Father, thank you for your goodness. I pray that you bless this invitation. I don't know the hearts of people that are here. But I pray if there's somebody, one or more, that has never accepted this truth, that salvation is by the promise that God gave us in Jesus Christ. They would be the day they'd accept that. Asking it in that name. Amen. Stand. Anna plays. You need to come this morning. It's, it's so simple. There's really nothing to do but accept the fact that Christ has already done it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all of y'all for being here today. God bless your hearts for coming. And I hope you'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock and then Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock. We're going through the book of Proverbs. Y'all ready to go home? All right. Dave, brother, would you dismiss us, please, sir?
It's not worth